very, very good afternoon, everybody, to another Afrocam show. My name is Ben, and I will be uh, commentating, if that is the right word, on some of the amazing things that we are going to be looking at this afternoon at our big variety of cameras scattered throughout Africa. And I think it looks like we're starting off at Tembi in KwaZulu-Natal, very close to the Mozambican border with some elephants, which is, of course, very relevant for Tembi Elephant Park, as it's also known. Uh, but thank you very much for joining us. And don't forget, you are welcome to send through any of your questions and comments live on whichever platform you are watching on. And I will do my best to discuss them as we go. Uh, but I think we've got a few hellos. Zygote, hello, hello. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, DNC, good morning. We're all ready with your coffee again. You do like your coffee, I recall, from last week as well. And hello, Karu, as well. Uh, thanks very much for joining us and everybody else. But what a lovely way to start with some elephants enjoying a little bit of water. Just trying to see if we can sex these. Looks like it's probably a couple of... Mm, is it a boy or a girl? Difficult to spot from this angle. Uh, but nice to see a couple of elephants, if nothing else, certainly. Of course, Tembi well known for its elephants and some of the big tuskers that they have on their reserve. But always great to see some activity. We saw some little impalas in the foreground as well. I wonder if we'll see them drink. I think they've already had a drink. Of course, elephants are very, very thirsty animals. You need a lot of water to deal with all of that uh, body there. So a big elephant bull is going to require, that does it like a young bull, I think, uh, is going to require somewhere between 120 to 150 litres of water, if you can believe that. Ah, looks like we've nipped across to, where are we now? I think we've gone to Tau, and we've got the water buck. Doing what water buck can do very well, of course, one of the few antelope species that are quite comfortable in water, as the name suggests. Uh, I've actually had a couple of experiences of that as well, whereby I remember once when I was working in the Sabi Sands, lions were chasing some water buck, and a big water buck bull took refuge in a dam, um, and the lions were unwilling to go in there. One of them actually did sort of manage to go in up to its chest, um, but they'd surrounded this poor water buck. But he just stayed in the water, there were no crocs for him to worry about. Uh, and eventually the lions got bored, or so we thought, and they moved away. And the poor unsuspecting water buck came out uh, and was promptly set upon by the lions. And I have to say he did not make it on that occasion. But, uh, so they are quite comfortable in water. You can see that one enjoying some of the, the sort of water weeds or those aquatic plants on the surface, which is not something I've seen very often. You normally see them associated with water, but I don't often see them actually feeding on um aquatic plant material but say very well suited for it and i'm sure many of you know they've got that rather sort of pungent smell to them uh, and you can see that long shaggy hair which is designed i think anyway uh, to keep them warm because it does get a lot cooler in lower lying areas where water tends to uh, accumulate uh, but that unpleasant smell is because of uh, a gland that they have in their skin that actually helps with waterproofing their fur. So just like those sort of crazy swimmers who uh, swim in the Atlantic or try and sort of cross the English Channel or something, uh, they'll smear grease on themselves and things just to uh, try and keep or insulate against some of the cold. Uh, but also if you've ever tried to swim wearing your clothes, uh, it's not easy. So when you've got long shaggy hair, you want the, that ability for the water to run off your hair. Um, a bit like a duck, I suppose, water off a duck's back. So one of the ways they can sort of leap through the water without too much problems. There is a bit of a misnomer that suggests that lions don't like water buck because of that funky smell that they give off. Um, but there have been a lot of tests done uh, and it's been pretty much proven beyond disrepute that Lions have no problem taking water back. They get taken as often as anything else. But from our perspective, we generally don't eat water back because if you were to um, perforate that gland, it certainly can taint the meat. But I see we've had a few more uh, comments coming through. It's lovely to hear from you guys. It's so cool to think that we can interact with you all over the world. Who have we got? Uh, Jan Powers, you're very welcome. Um, and I'm very happy to be here with you, Rolling Trouble. Another coffee drinker from Washington, Amber CO. Amber, very lovely to see you and a happy Tuesday to you too. Gemma, to you as well, sorry. Gemma, all the way from New Jersey. 
And uh, Mary Momo, where are you? From Hot Springs, Arkansas. Wow, that must that is far afield as well. And you've got some Mountain Valley spring water. Well, not, not coffee for everybody. <laughs> um, Tim, in terms of feeling greasy, I have to say I've never actually touched one. Uh, but I believe the fur is quite coarse. Um, but I honestly couldn't tell you whether or not it does feel slimy to the touch. I would highly doubt it. Um, because like if you pick up a duck, you don't get a sort of a residue on your hands, anything like that. I think it's more of a sort of, almost like that sort of spray you put in your clothes to make it water retardant, where you can see the, the water droplets forming uh, and just sort of rolling off your outerwear or your shoes, a bit like dubbing, I suppose. But uh, again, it's all about an ecological niche. Uh, it's a potentially a dangerous place. You are playing... Um, dangerous games with crocodiles. I know there was a crocodile seen at this waterhole earlier, and I believe we actually even maybe had some mating crocodiles at Tower earlier today, so lots of exciting things to see. But I suppose statistically there are less things to worry about in the water than uh, outside of it. Uh, and so lions in particular, which is obviously the water buck's major source uh, or major prey animal, are not fans of water at all. I have seen whole prides of lions walking down the road and they get to a puddle and the, the one in the front stops and they all sort of um, bump into each other uh, and then the ones at the front they sort of touch their paws against the water and they snarl and growl at it and then go way out of their way to sort of maneuver around the puddle so they don't get their little tootsies wet. So if you can escape into water it's a pretty good way to go. We often see impalas go into water to get away from dogs as well. And so I've also seen that happen and then an impala get taken out by a crop. So you never know. I've got a little moor hen wandering around in the foreground and a few Egyptian geese and a grey heron at the back. A few impalas. Of course we're hearing a lot of the sort of rutting noises from the impalas. We're in full rut at the moment. Um, and uh, you're hearing that sort of really almost terrifying growling sound that you would not uh, think that an impala would actually make. And I remember the first time I came to South Africa when I was doing my training, in fact, to become a field guide, safari guide, naturalist, whatever you'd like to call us, we were told, no, you can walk around after dark, there's no predators here. And I think it was about my second or third week I was walking around in the dark and I heard that growling very close to me. And I have to say, uh, uh, a change of underwear was in order after that, before I realised what impalas sound like. If you've never heard it, it really is quite an intimidating noise. Uh, it sounds like, speaking of crocs, we may have a croc at one of our other waterholes at uh, the Nomad Camera in Balule, so hopefully we can head over there uh, very, very shortly. But what a lovely scene here at Tau, always plenty to see. There we go, look at that beautiful creature. But probably for me, one of the most intimidating, uh, I wouldn't say underestimated, I think we all know the dangers of a crocodile, but one of the most perfect organisms on this planet, unchanged for hundreds of millions of years. I always say with crocodiles, shake, shakes? Crocodiles, snakes, sharks, uh, spiders, that is the epitome of if it's not broken, then don't fix it. They're fairly unevolved and it is perfection at work. And these things really are pretty, I don't want to say terrifying, because I don't want to vilify them, um, but some of you may be aware there was an incident with a, 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 a guide or a, a Kruger Trails ranger only last week, and it's actually somebody I know very, very well. He's, he was one of my instructors when I first came to do my training about 15 years ago. Still in the industry, still doing um, trails guide walks and training and things in the Kruger area. Uh, very much a bush guru knows what he's doing. Um, and uh, yeah, he was out doing a trail in Kruger last week and uh, went down to the water, uh, to, to the shallows, to scoop up some water to just have a drink and wash his face. Um, and I sort of had secondhand information via a few people, uh, sort of, you know, it's a very small network of, of people here. But apparently when he went down to scoop for the third time, he noticed that there was a, a crocodile's head under the water there. Instantly pulled back his hand, but it was too late. And this crocodile sprang up, grabbed him by the hand and ripped him into the water. Um, and apparently the guests and his backup, because you've normally got two, well, you'll always have two armed guides out on a, a walk in a big five area, uh, who was only 30 centimetres behind him, didn't even have a chance to relax, um, to react. 
uh, and just saw the back of his head with a bow wave before he was pulled under the water. Uh, the crocodile obviously tried to submerge him, uh, still had his hand sort of around the wrist and the, and the hand in his mouth and tried to spin him. Um, and being a very bush savvy person, didn't he didn't panic. He kind of bear hugged the crocodile so that it couldn't roll him properly. Um, and every time the croc went down, he would sort of spring off the off the floor to get back to the surface to, to get some air. And after a little bit of time, we, I don't know exactly how long it was, thankfully the crocodile let him go and he was able to scramble to the side, but had some nasty deep lacerations in his hand and fingers, didn't lose any fingers, thankfully, but tore his hamstring in the process of trying to get away from this croc. Um, in terms of size, uh, Kim Hai, you want to know how big the croc was? Again, what I can tell you is, uh, according to, to the guy in question, I won't use his name, but I know there are interviews and things on, uh, um, on the internet that you can find with him. He reckoned the head was around about uh, 50 centimeters long, um, and you can sort of equate that to around about somewhere between a three and a three and a half meter crocodile, so a decent size. Um, croc. So terrifying and could have gone horribly wrong and kudos for him to staying relaxed uh, and obviously you know, they called in for help and medical reinforcements arrived quickly. They've patched him up and he's already recovering. Uh, should get the entire use of all his hand back. So it could have been an awful lot worse. But a lot of guides will tell you how you know scary buffaloes are and things. But for me, you don't want to mess with a crocodile, the silent assassin um, of that aquatic world. They are real prehistoric relics. All right, sounds like we've got some flamingos in Kimberley at Campus Down. So let's head over there and see which flamingos we've got. Now I have to say flamingos are not one of my forte. We only have two species of flamingo here, uh, the greater and the lesser flamingo. So we're going to try and see if I can figure out which one of the two it is. But look at that beautiful flock of flamingos in Kimberley. Not something we get to see in the Kruger area very often. Um, I know up in Medikwe we get them from time to time. I'm just trying to see. Okay, it looks like lesser flamingos by the look of it. You can kind of see that darkish bill with a black tip to the bottom. Um, but difficult to tell the difference between the two, but we should get both uh, up there. They're very, very beautiful to see, and you can see a lot of them very much look as if they're coming into breeding plumage. You can see that almost salmon pink color reflecting nicely in the light there. Remember, a lot of birds uh, do um, increase the, the saturation of their colors and their feathers during breeding season, the males particularly to attract the female. And of course, flamingos color is not a, a true, well it is a pigment, but it, it's not a natural pigment in terms of the body creates it, it's, it's created through what they eat. And so they're what we call carotenoids and with the flamingos diet of sort of shellfish, um, they get a lot of those carotenoids from what they eat and then that translates into the color itself. So if you compare that to for example a blue color in a bird, if a bird was to die, that blue will always remain blue because it's actually a trick of the light. It's what's called Tyndall scattering and it's the different wavelengths of light because of the structure of the feather. Whereas carotenoids, the reds and the yellows and the, uh, the oranges that you see, they will generally fade on a, a deceased bird because he's not able to restock that carotenoids and the pigment color um, starts to diminish after a while. Uh, going back to the crop rolling trouble, you've asked how faster crocodiles on land, well faster than you might think, um, but you should be able to outrun one. They'll sort of raise themselves up uh, on their legs and take their belly off the ground and they can scuttle, um, but you should be able to outrun one. Um, and of course being a cold-blooded animal as well, uh, they need to be fairly warm in order to be fighting fit and they will get rather uh, tired quite quickly. So they do say the best thing you can do is zigzag because a crocodile can't change direction very well. Whether or not that is the case, um, thankfully I've never been in that situation nor do I ever want to be, but it's a very, very good rule of thumb out here that you don't go swimming in any water, that you don't know what is in there. And just because you can't see a croc, it doesn't mean that there's not one in there. They can hold their breath for over an hour. Oh wow, look at that, something's disturbed them. All right, it sounds like we have got uh, another croc. Let's pop over, since we seem to be on a bit of a 
a crop mission at the moment. I think it's back at Tau, I'm not 100% sure. Oh, look at those beautiful colorations on that skin. That's a good sized crocodile as well. Kanadi Ann, um, I believe he is already healing well. So I saw a, an interview that he did and he's talking very openly about it. It's the best thing you can do. Uh, really is just sort of chat about it and get on with life if you're going to spend your life doing these things like we do out here these things can happen um, and you know you can't hold it against the crocodile the crocodile just did what it was supposed to do and wh why he let, let him go I don't know probably I think because he was trying to do that sort of classic death roll but all of a sudden he's probably never had anything sort of clamp around him in a bear hug uh, and this guy's not a small guy uh, so it probably confused the crocodile more than anything else and maybe realised this was, uh, <laughs> excuse the phrase, a bit, bitten off a bit more than he could chew uh, and thankfully released him. Um, Mary, Mama, you wonder how long a croc can stay underwater? Well, it depends what the crocodile is doing. If they're in full sort of inactive mode, they can stay underwater for well in excess of an hour if they're just lying on the bottom um, and kind of sleeping if you want to. Actually, what makes crocodiles so incredible is that they have considered by many one of the most advanced hearts in the entire animal kingdom now all reptiles have a three chambered heart we have four chambered hearts as other animal uh, other mammals do but crocodiles even though it's a reptile also has a four chambered heart so to my knowledge it's the only reptile or the crocodilians are the only reptiles that have a four chambered heart and they have a very special um valve in there it always reminds me of something out of a sort of a pizza shop owner but it's called a foramen of panizza um he's keeping his legs tucked in uh, and what that allows the crocodile to do is in very simple terms is to decide where to send that oxygenated blood to i.e things that he's going to need so the brain the tail the lungs for example don't um, require oxygen whilst you're under air and the way the lungs are formed they're sort of fins of lots and lots of, of blood that can go through there in order to pick up the oxygen so you don't want to waste your blood by sending it into the lungs if you're not using them and a crocodile can kind of dictate where it wants to send the oxygenated blood to so it doesn't get used up so quickly um, and the carbon dioxide doesn't build up because when you go under water and you need to resurface it's not that you're running out of oxygen it's the carbon dioxide build up in your blood is becoming too great and that is the reaction as it feels like you uh, are running out of air as it were and they also have another really amazing function um, whereby they have a, a kind of a tube that connects something in and around their heart straight into their stomach and all that carbon dioxide that the body is being created is actually funneled into the stomach and carbon dioxide is really important for the creation of gastric juices and crocodiles can eat pretty much anything they've got one of the most acidic stomachs in the animal kingdom to digest bone and uh, hair and all sorts of other things that they will eat so crocodile hearts are really amazing things certainly Tim Grace in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Cough, another one with coffee in hand, ready to learn. Well, hopefully you've learned something about crocodile hearts there. Go and do some reading on crocodile hearts. They are amazing. And in fact, crocodiles in general, um, say these prehistoric relics have got so many adaptations that have made them so successful over such a long period of time. Um, Alison in Liverpool, my backyard in the UK. Have I ever known a croc to kill somebody? I personally don't know anybody who has succumbed to a crocodile, but many people have been killed by crocodiles. It's that sort of classic interpretation that the hippo kills more people in Africa than any other animal. Uh, I think, and I think many people would agree with, would agree with me, uh, that it is actually the crocodile that is responsible for more deaths. The thing with the crocodile is there's often no evidence. It's rather macabre way of looking at it but even if they do take something they'll often stash it underwater uh, that just helps with the decomposition process of the meat makes it easier for the crocodile to eat um, so thankfully I don't know anybody who has been taken by a crocodile uh, this guy I do know say last week is the closest that I've heard uh, but I certainly wouldn't want to be a part of it that's for sure uh, Zygote and Karu, I'm sorry, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. It does have a beautiful pattern, certainly. Uh, lovely yellows and greys. We've got a little imposter at the back. We've got a water buck come to say hello. A youngster. Don't get too close to that crocodile, little one. 
sneer of his uh, lips there as if to say, oh, are we processing the fact that there's a croc there? Uh, certainly a crocodile that size could take, oh goodness, I hope, oh wow this might be interesting, uh, that's a little rock which obviously looks as if it's been a scratching post, I'm sure the water buck has seen the croc and the croc doesn't look overly keen yet, it knows it doesn't have the element of surprise but it is the ultimate opportunist hunter, oh I'm getting quite nervous for this little water buck, don't go poking things around you don't know, at least you're going to the less toothy side. Huh? Well, I suppose this is how you learn. Obviously, that rock is helping because the crocodile in this situation would, it's got incredible muscle in its body and its trunk and its tail, and its the reactor would be to sort of whip around. That rock is going to get in his way, and I think it's more likely just to move off. Yeah, there we go. Sure, I had my heart in my mouth for a minute. I thought we were going to see something pretty horrific yet spectacular. Ooh. But generally speaking, when they're out on the surface, uh, crocodiles are, I don't want to say placid, um, but they know they've lost the element of surprise. Uh, he's out there warming up, remember being cold blooded or ectothermic. But look how curious those little water bucks are, that's amazing. Well, lesson learned, don't play with fire too often, little ones. Where are your parents? Although water bucks say, do you have a habit of uh, forming little creches um, as calves, and they become independent a little bit earlier than some other antelope species. Looks like two girls. I don't see any hint of little horns, but you'd almost expect the, the boys to be prodding at the crocodile rather than the girls, but it's all exploration, I, can, I suppose. Sometimes it goes horribly wrong, but we'll chalk that one up to a little bit of life experience for those two. <laughs> They've harassed the crocodile sufficiently now, but yeah, I just see him disappear into the water. They, the way they move through the water is almost not a ripple at all. So terrifying things. I certainly. I actually was in Lake Tanganyika once um, and there was talk of it that there had been a crocodile being seen there and I was actually lucky enough to do a spot of water skiing there but of course your um, brain is now thinking because someone's told you there's been a crocodile there. Lake Tanganyika is massive, it's almost like an inland ocean but I, I fell off my water skis at one point and whilst waiting for them to come back I'm sure I saw a crocodile there and I just froze in the water. I couldn't think of anything else to do but to just sort of sit there motionless not draw attention to myself and hope for the best. I've no idea whether there was a croc there, but it was a very uncomfortable sort of 30 second wait uh, for that boat to come back. Oh, it sounds like um, we might be able to go and have a look at our black eagle. Now, any of you that were watching the Wild Moment show, I'm trying to think, was it, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, may know our regular visitor of the Varose eagle, as it's now known. There she is. I'd be, I would love to see how big the chick is. I know now that she's sort of, because they reuse the nest, she's built up that, uh, that wall of twigs between us and her. But it would be great to have a look at the chick to see how much she's grown over the last 10 days or so. So, of course, this is Makatsa. Very well. Ah, oh, and there is the other one bringing back something, looks like the leaf just lining, um, Maloria is the male, thank you, so Maloria Makatsa, so yeah, bringing back something to line the nest, hopefully we'll be able to see the chick, I don't see anything yet, but always good to see some doting parents, magnificent animal though, look at the, the, how sleek those feathers are, and the size of that beak, of course, basically the largest eagle that we have here. Oh, the chick hasn't hatched, I've just realised. I thought we saw, I'm obviously getting it confused with another camera that I watched. My apologies everybody, there is no chick, chick yet. Um, sounds like it's potentially due sometime early June, so that would explain why she's bringing nesting material back. Sorry viewers, 
I've watched so many of these sort of camera feeds recently uh, that I've obviously got myself confused. Uh, it was last time we watched the the video of the chick from last year. That's why I got myself all in a bit of a fuzzle there. Well, let's hope everything is all right at the nest, but great to see both parents still playing their part. Uh, incubation, I would have to check uh, in terms of the exact amount, but I imagine it's probably about 40 days, something like that, with one of these larger birds. I'm going to quickly check here. I, unfortunately, I can't remember all of these facts and figures. Uh, about 44 to 48 days. There we go. How she got there? I'm just doing a little bit of uh, home improvement on the nest. Which are a huge animal, this Varese eagle. I don't know if any of you have ever seen a Varese eagle sort of sitting or standing on the ground because you don't really get a good perspective when they're flying and sort of soaring uh, around the cliffs above you, which is normally where you do see them. Um, if you actually see one standing next to you, I mean, it stands the best part of 90 centimetres, 95 centimetres tall. Um, certainly on me, that comes up to sort of my middle of my thigh. It's an enormous bird when you see it, and it's stocky too, incredibly strong. Yeah, I've just been informed as well that we have seen them bring some dassies and scrub hairs, and dassies, the, uh, the rock hyraxes, uh, which is their favourite food and often their distribution very much linked to the availability of uh, dussies. Back to the nest, perhaps provisioning the nest, or I would think rather to feed the adults that is uh, doing the incubating. <laughs> Hello. Might have just seen that nictitating membrane sweep across the eye as well. But speaking of eyes and uh, dussies, those dussies have an incredible adaptation in the eye. They always have like an inbuilt sunglasses inbuilt ultraviolet filter one of the few animals that can actually stare directly into the sun and still see very very well and that is this whole evolutionary arms race between the dussy and its primary predator which is these feroes eagle formerly black eagles the dussies of course love uh, hopping around on these rocks and they've got those some special glands in their feet that make their feet all sticky so that they don't slip off but they always have to be very much on guard for a marauding for those eagles to drop out of the sky. <laughs> I'm sure he knows the camera is here. It keeps giving us a very quizzical look. I'd love to see a bit of those maternal instincts. Um, just seeing her moving around um, the, uh, the sticks there, just making sure everything is comfortable for the little egg inside probably just one normally it's just one if it's two remember one will be an insurance policy unfortunately the second one to hatch generally will not be looked after uh, it is there very much in case the first one doesn't make it <laughs> i wonder if they're hearing something strange cocking of the head all right well good to know that they are still going well and still looking after the nest i think let's head back to town and see if anything's happening if that crocodile has re-emerged or our water buck are still milling around the shoreline. Now I don't see any sign of the croc, but we obviously had a different, uh, oh that was a, that was a different uh, camera we were looking at, sorry, of course that was in Malule, we're now back in Medikwe of course, uh, but lovely to see these water buck out in the open, also known as an eco species, you don't always just get them next to the water, I uh, also find them sort of on the boundaries between different habitats. They're predominantly grazing animals, so it makes sense to find them close to water where there is more availability of grass. Uh, but you'll often find them at sort of woodland fringes between the, the grassier area and more wooded areas. They seem to enjoy that, that type of habitat. Let's see if we can pick out some of the bird life. A little bit small at the moment, plenty of Egyptian geese and say what looks like a... Oh, what's that in the water in the foreground? Is that a croc? A croc coming out of the water? Or are my eyes deceiving me? But it looks like a, either a coot or a moorhen. Uh, and they're just to the left behind or just in front of the waterbuck's rump or left of the rump where you can see that white sort of cask on the top of his head. 
always a good spot to do some birding, especially when there's water around. All right, but we are pretty much out of time, but I hope you enjoyed that. It was some amazing sightings. It was very, very interesting to see how curious and possibly suicidal those little water bucks were. Uh, but I'm glad they got away from that situation unscathed. But it's been an absolute pleasure to um, chat to you and bring you some of these great uh, views. Oh, what's going on at the back there? Oh, I thought the impala was nudging the little bird there, but uh, maybe not. Um, but it's yeah, wonderful to spend some time with you. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed it. And, of course, we will see you very soon for another AfriCam show, and I'm sure a wild moment show on Thursday. But thanks again, and have a fantastic day. <laughs>